On this podcast, we go one step beyond publications and guidelines to speak directly with leading experts in interventional pulmonology. This podcast will address not only fundamental topics in exciting publications, but also unconventional topics for which the evidence base isn't that robust. The views expressed on this podcast are those of the speaker and not necessarily endorsed by the AABIP. This is your host, Odit Chadda, an assistant professor at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. And with that, let's dive into the next episode. On today's episode, we will be discussing a topic that a lot of listeners wanted to hear about. Tuberculosis, what an interventional pulmonologist needs to know. And for this, I'm fortunate to have with me a leading expert in the world with expertise, in, with extensive expertise and experience in managing patients with tuberculosis. Dr. Ravindra Mehta is the Chief of Pulmonary and Critical Care Medicine at the Apollo Hospitals in Bangalore, India. It is truly a pleasure to have him on the podcast with me today. Thank you, Dr. Mehta, for your time. Thank you, Udit, for inviting us. And uh, it'll be nice to go through this unusually extensive third world topic. Absolutely, absolutely. And it is an extensive topic. Uh, before we do start, though, uh, any conflicts of interest to disclose? Uh, no, thank you. Okay, so as we've already mentioned, it's a broad topic. A lot of matter will be covered in this episode. So let's get started. So uh, let's discuss endobronchial tuberculosis first. You know, it's been reported to occur in 15 to 40% of the patients with TB. I think this has been best quantified in a recent study by Su et al. from China published in Respiration, where uh, they prospectively bronched uh, 1,442 patients with pulmonary TB. And they found that out of them, 345, that is about a quarter of those patients, had evidence of tracheobronchial TB. However, 60% of those people with tracheobronchial TB developed tracheobronchial stenosis, out of which a quarter was severe in nature. So, Dr. Mehta, when do we suspect tracheobronchial TB? When do I inspect the airways of a patient with pulmonary TB? Yeah, so it's an extremely interesting topic, and it brings out the pinnacle of what uh, interventional pulmonary and tuberculosis uh, uh, together represent. Uh, because initially when you start treating tuberculosis and we'll be talking about a lot of these aspects, uh, you think you're okay and then over time patients develop these issues with extremely challenging uh, uh, tracheobronchial involvement, which can be a, a massive problem. The closest analogy we have is transplant. I mean, lung transplant related issues with the uh, airway stenosis is quite similar. So in a tuberculosis patient, when we put them on therapy and we find that the response is not commensurate, to what we would have accept, expected. For example, if, if after four weeks or so, they're still coughing away, they have hemoptysis, uh, they're still short of breath. Those are the clinical adages where we start thinking that is there something more above and beyond what's going on. In the paper, they nicely pointed out some risk factors of uh, age, uh, the female sex, which, which, is, uh, which is where the where tuberculosis, uh, airway tuberculosis is more common. And the fact is cough person. Four weeks. So those are the the the, the data. The, uh, those represent the data they they talked about. But by and large, clinically, when we don't see a response at four weeks, and if you are fortunate enough to do an X-ray, then you may catch a finding of some subtle collapse and so on, which will trigger a search for airway involvement, which is quite uh, uh, critical. And the earlier you intervene, the better is the outcome, and that's why it's important to catch it early. Okay, so basically symptoms that would suggest airway involvement, waiting for about four weeks and if there's persistence, and maybe a lower threshold in females, I presume, because of smaller airway size. Yeah, so uh, the female question, if I can add to it, Udit, is basically there's a whole, a whole lot of theories on why females get more endobronchial or more airway involvement in tuberculosis. And they say it's because of the, the smaller uh, uh, total airway size, mucostasis because of that, the left main bronchus has a predilection because of the angulation and again mucostasis. And some theory also of the aorta compressing that particular area as well as lymph node involvement over there compressing that area. Got so it. females age less than 50, left main bronchial involvement is much uh, is commonly seen in airway tuberculosis. Practically on the ground, when we see TB, it's usually the fact that it's missed airway tuberculosis. It's caught much later when either they're getting short of breath or an X-ray shows collapse. So the Chinese paper brought out some subtle and early factors, but most of the time it's in the second, third or fourth month when you're not getting a response, symptoms out of proportion to the expected response is when you start looking for airway TB and that too with somebody who's got a low index of suspicion and, and, and looking for it. Perfect, perfect. And uh, how does airway TB look 
So airway tuberculosis, again, I mean, when you start looking for it, it's the X-ray you start off with, the chest radiograph. Uh, it's obviously followed by a CT scan. And uh, there is gross involvement, the major airways, just like any other uh, intervention science. And of course, the subtle distal airway involvement. Mm -hmm. distal but bronch airway bronchoscopically, how, how would you... Uh, yeah, Right. So bronchoscopically is where they describe many patterns and the patterns are by and large based on the involvement, pathological involvement of the airway. Uh, so the, the patterns also have been described by different authors in different ways. Uh, the original descriptions were six to seven patterns, which go from, as you can imagine, subtle involvement. So they described a non-specific bronchitic type. And as it increases further, you can imagine it's going to become more inflamed. So describe the hyperemic uh, uh, edematous type and then as you develop the caseation it's coming through the mucosa and actively caseating type was talked about if that ulcerates through an ulcerative type develops if there's lymph nodes coming through the bronchus uh, along with the ulcer or uh, by themselves and that produces a tumorous type mm -hmm. and uh, and so these are the multiple types described and then finally when the scarring process kicks in is when you have the fibrostenotic type which is the main one we deal with Mm -hmm. Now, in the midst of this, the Chinese guys who presented that paper have also used, changed names a little with the, call, the one of the terms they call is a lymphatic type, which actually is a tumorous type mm -hmm. and, uh, and so on and so forth. But on, on a gross platform, it's going to be very clear. You're going to see caseation, you're going to see growth in the airway, you're going to see either lumpy, bumpy, granular appearances, or you're going to see what is the most dreaded form, the fibrostenotic type. And I guess you would manage this as any other benign airway disease, right? You know, like if you have to cut and dilate, you do that, but with a very high threshold to stent. So again, the pathophysiology guides the management because the pathophysiology is, is either early where you have active inflammation and infection and disease, mm -hmm. which is the caseating type, the granular type and the ulcerative type. You will be having a slightly different approach compared to the fibrostenotic type, which is done and dusted. It's basically a... Uh, uh, issue where the active disease is gone, but you're dealing with sequelae. So in the active form, you will be cautious in terms of trying to be too aggressive because you're probably going to cause uh, uh, more of a problem over there. So you try to, to, to bail out the crisis at that time in case it's there. Uh, and many therapies are talked about. So again, if we get into that at this point, it's going to be reduce the, the tumorous type, uh, reduce the obstruction of the airway and a lot of hot or cold therapies may be talked about in that particular uh, uh, pathology. But when you reach the fibrostenotic type, it's like any other airway, tracheal stenosis, tracheal obstruction, where you mm -hmm. are going to use your therapies to try and either figure out the stenosis. Is it complex? Is it simple? Is it only mu uh, you know, uh, mucosal? Is it mucocartilaginous? Mm -hmm. And then decide a strategy of uh, both re uh, first recanalization and then consider stenting. Perfect. Thank you so much. Okay, so let's move on to TB lymphadenitis. Now, TB lymphadenitis accounts for up to 40% of patients with extrapulmonary TB. So uh, let's look at intrathoracic lymph nodes. So uh, Dr. Mehta, would you agree that EBUS TBNA is the first-line diagnostic approach for TB in accessible intrathoracic lymph nodes? Right. So my name is Mehta. So I should be always be talking of conventional TBNA. Uh, <laughs> So, yeah, so the original science of, uh, of course, sampling the lymph nodes came from conventional TBNA. And of course, now EBUS TBNA is pretty much what's there in most parts of the world. But if we talk of sampling of the lymph nodes, yes. Uh, so it, it comes down to your area of prevalence. So if, if we're in a high prevalence TB area like, like India and some parts of the world, uh, the approach is twofold. A, make a diagnosis and B, in modern times, get enough material for resistance markers. So this is very similar to what we do in oncology or lung cancer or any other metastatic cancer, where you want tissue to make sure you are on the right track. At the same time, you want enough of molecular markers over there. Tuberculosis resistance has become a major component of what we deal with in our part of the world. So every attempt at, at looking at a lymph node is A, is it tuberculosis? And B, can I get enough material to define the resistance markers? So with this background, you need sampling. Sampling is either by conventional TBNA if they're large enough because the case is often and you can get enough material. Or of course, EBS, EBS TBNA where you can define every part, probably sample more nodes, get pooled samples. The challenge here is what sort of bronchoscopy do you do? As we all say, when you go in with the scope, you want to do enough and maximum amount of work so as to get an answer. Mm -hmm. So you have with you a lavage. You have with you, if there's a parent camel infiltrated transbronchial biopsy, you have with you a lymph node and awful of these coexist. Mm 
And so you have to use a combination of all these strategies so as to get an answer, hoping that you have only one uh, type of bacillus. If you have a mixture of sensitive and resistant, you can have trouble. But maximal sampling of a comprehensive nature, both to establish a diagnosis and get material for resistance molecular markers is the target. Now, with this background, EBUS tbna has obviously been studied a lot recently, and the ballpark figure of around 80% comes in. Mm-hmm. Now, the, 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 the percentage of how you're going to catch this is also based on whether you're looking at a cytological component or a microbiological component. So tuberculosis has become very interesting that way. A cytological or a histopathological component obviously will be showing the granulomas. The caseation obviously makes it uh, even stronger with the pretest probability. And then you look at the molecular markers and that's science and evolution because they've gone through the initial PCR, which is now given up and the more late and the later gene expert, which is basically nested PCRs Mm -hmm. and the newer one called gene ultra, Mm -hmm. not to make things too complex for people who deal with it less, but by and large, these are newer molecular markers coming in with greater sensitivity, maybe at the cost of specificity, but which have enhanced the diagnosis tremendously. So yes, Conventional tBNA or EBUS tBNA yield around 80%, targeting multiple modalities and comprehensive sampling. Okay, so if I may clarify a couple of things here. So Dr. Mehta mentioned the 80% ballpark number, which has been shown in two different 2015 meta-analyses of 14 and 8 uh, eight studies, respectively. Now, when you say comprehensive sampling with EBUS tBNA, you're referring to sending the sample for cytology, making sure we have an AFP stain, but also, I presume, microbiological sampling, right? So sending some in saline so that it can be studied uh, from a culture perspective. Right. So, and- so to break, break it up and make it simple, you do the usual cytology. I mean, that's your... You do histopathology if you get core samples so that they augment the diagnosis. Uh, and sometimes those are the most important things. And then the microbiology comprises of the usual acid-fast bacilli smear and acid-fast bacilli culture and the molecular test with something called gene expert. So mm-hmm. it's called expert RIF, which mm-hmm. looks for rifampicin resistance. And its newer cousin is something, something called gene ultra. Yes. To make the science interesting, gene expert catches around 116 colony forming units per ml, while the gene ultra, which has just come out and endorsed by WHO, mm-hmm. uh, catches around 16 colony forming units per ml. So there's mm-hmm. a heightened sensitivity in the same test so as to make a diagnosis at the same time defined resistance markers. Perfect. Thank you so much. So uh, Gene Expert has been studied. There's a study by actually one of your colleagues, uh, Prashant Chache, in uh, ERJ Open from 2019. There's another study that I came across in PLOS One from 2015 from Ethiopia. And then there's one, I think, by uh, from Korea, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, but uh, just to clarify, so, you, so when we look for resistance with Gene Expert, we're looking for rifampin resistance. But this is a surrogate for MDRTB, right? I mean, they, they coexist in about more than 90, 90% of the cases, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, so absolutely. So basically, it's a surrogate. It's a beginning test. It's the fastest way. So if you just dial the clock back, say, to a, a decade ago, you would wait for the AFB, the, the acid-fast bacilli culture. And that took long. Even the fastest back tech culture takes a minimum of three to four weeks. And by that time, you would not have a handle on whether there's resistance or no, especially in areas of the world like we are, or in fact, half the world at this point. So Gene Expert came as a revolutionary thing, and it doesn't take a lot of material for it. So it's been looked at both in parenchyma, in lymph nodes, and in extra palmy samples extensively. Mm -hmm. Uh, Gene Ultra is a newer version which has come. Again, both of them are sent in saline. So the yield of gene expert in EBUS uh, within the lymph nodes is around, like we said, ballpark figure of 80%. Gene Ultra is adding another 25 to 30%. So it goes to around 85 to 90%. Okay. And again, like I said, if you combine it with a lavage or uh, uh, and so on and so forth, you get yields up to 90 plus percent. So again, the idea is uh, you get sampling enough, send it in saline so that you get resistance markers. Now you are talking of MDR-TB. Now, this starts the whole story. Once you know that the gene expert or the gene ultra has shown you resistance, then your options are to either wait for the regular culture or there are more tests. There's something called LPA. Here is where I get a little more confusing with it. You have to forgive me for those parts of the world who really don't love TB. <laughs> but we have no option, just like COVID. And so we, uh, so LPA or line probe assay actually goes into further drugs. So it's not only rifampicin, it will look at more drugs. And there is LPA1, LPA2, the generations which are coming. 
So if you get a decent amount of material and you know the science, you can send all this off so as to not only get the diagnosis, but determine resistance for multiple drugs up front. So in a span of three to four days, which never happened before, you're in a position to start an effective regimen, which decides the ultimate prognosis of patients with resistant tuberculosis. Perfect. Thank you so much. So you had a study published on 30 patients in um, in whom uh, EBUS uh, transbronchial forceps biopsy was done. And in eight of the 30 patients who were negative on EBUS tBNA on rows, you had an additional positive diagnosis with the transbronchial forceps through EBUS. Uh, six out of those eight uh, had TB. Now, most of the tests that you're mentioning, culture, you know, staining, uh, PCR-based testing, etc., you don't find out that on rows. So where do you see transbronchial forceps fitting in with EBUS? Yeah, so it's a lovely question which actually asks us about the, the next level modality as well as the, the utility of that modality. So when we did this paper, we actually were, were faced with what tuberculosis is known as the master mimic. So if you're lucky to have a nice KZS pulpy node where you're going to get enough material, you're going to get all these things without much difficulty. But understand, again, tuberculosis in the lymph node is a posse-pacillary disease. There are multiple, there is eccentric involvement, so you may not hit the right area, just like a cancerous lymph node. Mm -hmm. Thirdly, uh, there are also dead bacilli admixed with live bacilli, so they can also confound your test because the, the molecular test, the expert and the ultra catch every bacillus, while the culture will only catch the live bacillus. Mm -hmm. There are issues with processing of the sample. You know, you, when you try to, uh, the sample is processed for the cultures, there's a certain uh, process of decontamination, uh, transfer, and so on and so forth. So when you put all these wild cards together, there is a certain negativity which comes, uh, a negative yield which comes with sampling. So, and of course, the lymph node. The lymph node may be a little more firm. It may be early. It may be a little different. So in these patients, when we found, in, in a few patients, when we found that the lymph nodes are firm and we did EBUS tBNA with rows, and we're fortunate enough to have rows in our institution, we could not establish a clear diagnosis by way of the granuloma, the necrotizing granuloma, which actually tells us that we are on target. In such a situation, um, our option is either to wait for the culture, but in this particular subset, we, we went ahead and did a forceps biopsy so, biopsy so as to enhance the yield. And we managed to get more materials so as to meet all the endpoints we talked about earlier. Now, clearly, as you said, we're not going to get any of the molecular markers at that point. We're just going to see the granuloma. So if we get the granuloma, then by as a surrogate, we should have enough bacilli around it that you're able to meet uh, the, the molecular requirements which come out of tuberculosis diagnosis. That was the idea. To put the role of this forceps in context, we clearly said um, you know, there was a paper from Yale before from, from Jonathan Puchalski's group where they used the forceps extensively uh, by the same technique, the cautery technique. Mm -hmm. And we always say that you know when you're doing something in one part of the world, there's always somebody in some other part of the world doing the same thing. So same time, we both both of us both of us were doing it two groups, but they published it early and then we put our results out after that. They just put out the general forceps yield. Well, we looked at uh, the role of that in negative rows so that we make it very clear that we're not putting it up front. And there in these negative rows patients, we managed to get enough material so as to define the endpoints. But we got pathology over there. And that as a surrogate of enough material so as to meet microbiological endpoints. So a little lengthy way of explaining the same thing. But I think it, it pushes the point in. Uh, of course, there's more to be studied on this matter, but do you routinely use it now? So say you suspect TB, rose negative, are you doing forceps biopsies? Yeah, so if there is any suspicion, we've taken it beyond TB also, Okay. Uh, but it, it's a lot of thinking process because we have to counsel patients up front, be ready for it because it needs yes. a deeper level of anesthesia. So like you said, yes, a modality to be thought about, yes, something put out there, but certainly needs more study and thought processes depending on your pretest probability and the diagnosis you're looking for. Fantastic. Okay, so let's talk about tuberculous pleural effusions now. So, you know, tuberculous pleural effusion may occur as a result of a delayed hypersensitivity reaction to mycobacteria or the mycobacterial antigens in the pleural space in sensitized individuals, or it may be due to rupture of a subpleural focus of pulmonary disease into the pleural space. Uh, what about the mechanism, Dr. Mehta? How do I establish a diagnosis of TB just based on pleural fluid studies? Right. So being in a land of mediastinal lymph nodes and pleural effusions, it's been an extremely difficult thing to deal with these, uh, with these particular uh, effusions as whether it's benign, malignant, tuberculous, malignant, uh, you know, uh, uh, non-specific and so on and so forth. Uh, 
So your point is very well taken. The, in, in tuberculosis, either a hypersensitivity reaction or it's actually a parenchymal area which is given way and you get a effusion secondary to that. Now, the, the approach to that is quite different based on what is there. In the past, when we only had a chest x-rays and maybe uh, ultrasounds, and you would not look at the parenchyma, you would just do a pleural tap. Uh, you would use the usual um, you know, lights criteria. And uh, to, in, in, in two sentences, a lymphocytic predominant effusion with a high adenosine deaminase level, which we say above 70 over here. The numbers are varied between 60 and 70, but those are the ballpark figures. By and large, with a PPD positive and a high pretest probability defined, uh, give us a diagnosis of tuberculosis. Uh, Again, in high, high prevalence areas, if you did not get um, the ADA, the adenosine DMINAs as being that high, if you had anything between 40 and 60 with a lymphocytic predominant effusion and they talk of a lymphocyte neutrophil ratio, you could still establish a clinical diagnosis of tuberculosis. More papers came which said that if you start doing CT scan, then you have a methodological approach where you address the parenchyma in case of infiltrates and the pleura. Then between the two, either by doing a bronchoscopy with a lavage plus minus further modalities and a pleural tap or further modalities like a thoracoscopy, you can make a diagnosis and this was nicely brought about. To keep it simple for the effusion, this is what we do in high prevalence areas. But if we cannot establish a diagnosis, then the next modality is either the closed plural biopsy. And uh, we know that uh, this was talked about a lot. It's part of your ACCP seek questions also, where a closed plural biopsy along with histopathology and microbiology has a 70% chance of making a diagnosis without getting more invasive. Next step is medical thoracoscopy, which has an extremely high yield, close to 100% in establishing a diagnosis of tuberculosis with the additional advantage of what we talked about before, comprehensive sampling. I get enough tissue, I get the histopath, and I get for all the molecular markers and the cultures which I need. So in a setting like yours where, you know, TB is very common and also the incidence of MDR-TB, I presume, is, is decently common or any form of drug-resistant TB. Uh, just relying on pleural fluid studies, you don't get sensitivities, right? Because growing TB in the pleural fluid is extremely challenging. So do you so, routinely go to close pleural biopsies or thoracoscopic biopsies when you're tapping someone with a high suspicion of TB or at least a high suspicion of drug-resistant TB? So it, it brings about a very interesting question, which we've talked... Uh, this question is very interesting because it comes back to the molecular markers we talked about. So we talked of... Uh, Molecular markers in tuberculosis, we talked of the prevalence in the lymph node, but the extra pulmonary yield of molecular markers like Gene Expert and Gene Ultra has not been too great. Mm -hmm. Ballpark figures for Gene Expert is around 20 to 30%. Gene Ultra is a little more 35 to 40% in areas which have it. But that's all you have. And the culture is not great at all at around 25 to 30% in studies. Mm -hmm. So if the plural fluid gives you an answer, easy non-invasive, I mean, minimally invasive outpatient and you get these molecular tests, you're all done. But if you don't do it, your next option is closed pleural biopsy or a medical thoracoscopy. Uh, we tend to go towards medical thoracoscopy because at that point, if you're going to do a procedure, you mm -hmm. might as well do something which is conclusive. A lot of a thoracoscopy in simple free-flowing uh, patients, uh, free-flowing effusions in our patients happens in an outpatient setup also. So we manage to get them out in a daycare morning to evening uh, uh, procedure. And that helps to conclusively make a diagnosis. However, if you have a huge load, and we do that, have that in our uh, high TB prevalent tuberculosis hospitals, they'll often do multiple closed plural biopsies and first try to make a diagnosis with those so as to spare the medical thoracoscopy slightly complicated uh, part of it. Perfect. So start with pleural fluid drainage, look at the cell count, look at the uh, lights criteria, ADA. look at the ADA level and send the fluid for PCR-based testing. If it's negative, proceed to a biopsy. Absolutely. Okay. And then is there a role in checking interferon gamma levels in the pleural fluid? Yeah. So interesting science. Never made it to the bedside. High prevalence areas, lovely meta-analysis, no real role to play. Low prevalence areas, maybe you guys uh, you know, can look at it differently. Maybe have, may have some role to play, but very additive and does not meet any of the endpoints of comprehensive sampling. So something to be mentioned, but not commonly practiced. Perfect. If I may add that, you know, there, there have, this has been looked at and that the T, spot TB, the quant cold, they have low sensitivity and specificity, uh, as we would imagine. Uh, I, I think there's studies coming uh, out from South Africa, or at least being conducted on the IRISA TB, which, uh, of course, and also the role of 
IL-27. But that's all, of course, something for the future. So, um, okay, so, you know, TB pleural effusions, again, can be one of three forms, right? It could be just a simple pleuritic, TB empyema, or uh, a pseudochylus or a chylus collection. Now, regarding TB empyema specifically, does your management algorithm of tube thoracostomy plus minus TPADNAs plus minus surgical decortication when need be mirror your algorithm of managing any other patient with subacute presentations of bacterial empyema? Or do you treat TB empyema differently than a subacute or chronic bacterial empyema? Right. So uh, the TB empyema presentation can be of two types. One, you get an empyema and uh, you're not sure what it, what is it. In our part of the world, it can be either. Depending on the clinical history, we sometimes can take a good shot at finding out what it is. The initial plural tap may help you and often it may not. So if you're not sure, then the management is pretty much similar to any empyema. I mean, if it's free-flowing, it's drained regularly. If it's loculated, then you have to consider some sort of uh, tube thoracostomy with uh, agents like you mentioned, and I'll touch on those. Or you go ahead and uh, either do a medical thoracoscopy um, or you go ahead and do a proper surgical slash VATS uh, uh, procedure plus minus decortication. Uh, so when we when when we approach a general empyema, this is what happens. Uh, but when you have a particular tuberculous process, you're pretty sure about that. Uh, you, you have to look at it from similar perspectives, but understanding that usually by the time you diagnose them, you have a pretty thick peel out there. So a, a, a good pretest probability on the CT scan and the duration of disease. So if it's crossed a month or so and you look at your peel, and you know that it's quite thick, then you will not venture into medical thoracoscopy. Mm-hmm. You'll go straight for surgical or VATS decortication. The particular aspect of thrombo, you know, the TPA and the Dornase, we don't have uh, Dornase over here. So only pushing TPA slash saline slash a bunch of things which have been talked about has not made a lot of sense. So we pretty much wind up skipping that step. Yes, we may use streptokinase, urokinase, or TPA in patients who are not candidates for a higher level procedures like medical thoracoscopy or surgery. But otherwise, we'll directly take a jump to either medical thoracoscopy or surgery to try and completely drain these areas and, and try and get a plural, plural approximation so as to minimize long-term plural fibrosis. Now, the main question that arises if you go for a procedure, what is your thresh indication? Loculated TB empyemas, once you know about them, uh, they are the ones who will qualify for this. Uh, at the same time, uh, if your if uh, um, particular institution favors one over the other, for example, we will wind up doing a lot of medical thoracoscopies with locular lysis and so on, and a little more on, on the aggressive front out there. But otherwise, a lot of these patients will straight go for surgical procedures to drain them. Bottom line, not very different from bacterial empyemas. Uh, free-flowing can be left as it is with hardly any restriction. Loculated uh, effusions need to be drained completely. Modality may be tube thoracostomy plus minus only thrombolytics in our part of the world, but you can use combination therapy where you have them. And medical thoracoscopy slash surgery with a decision taken based on what outcome you expect uh, on, on, uh, on CT scan, the peel expectation and so on. Perfect. So stage two, uh, fibropurulent medical thoracoscopy, stage three, organizing plural rind uh, VATS. Absolutely. The main thing is to take that call. That call is quite challenging. The only thing mm-hmm. I would put as a practice adage more than what's seen in literature is TB empyema, uh, TB uh, uh, effusions with loculation are a little forgiving. So even if you wind up taking a call for a medical thoracoscopy and you go in and you find the lungs not completely coming up, if the lung comes up around 70, 80%, the long-term outcomes are excellent. We followed a whole bunch of these people and so we're quite at ease when we see that if a lesser level procedure has to be done for a bunch of reasons, you're okay not completely taking up every part of the peel and you know freeing the parietal pleura, the visceral pleura, the diaphragm. If you do a reasonably good job, have an open pleural space, drain the infection component and give the right TB chemotherapy, you're going to get away with it. Perfect, perfect. This has been amazing. Thank you so much, Dr. Mehta, for your time. Uh, I know we've covered a lot of points here. Any closing comments? Yeah, so I'd like to just point out the whole spectrum. I would like to say that we use the word master mimic. TB is the master mimic. I mean, much as you guys are lucky to have less of it, a lot of it here actually sets the stage for a lot uh, uh, interesting both science, dealing with complex patients, increases the intervention uh, work a lot because now we become a country of, like I said, uh, medestinal lymph nodes and pleural effusions. So there's a lot of bronch happening for that. And TB bronchostenosis, which you started the discussion with, 
is actually a nightmare. It's very complex. And the entire gamut of what IP people like to do, define a stenosis, look at the wall part of it, see the length part of it, what strategy to use, how many times do you dilate, when do you stand, what's the exit strategy for the stent, which airway can I do, what stent, why stent, straight stents, metal stents, and so on. The whole plethora and the whole panorama of uh, IP is exemplified in this particular disease. So it's been a highly uh, interesting and uh, prototype uh, of how airway stenosis can be dealt with. And that's what tuberculosis has added to our spectrum. I trained in the US where I hardly had an exposure to all this. And coming back to a country like India has actually been uh, very both illuminating, revealing, and at the same time thinking on your feet in trying to deal with this particular issue. This podcast too has been illuminating, revealing, interesting, and more. Thank you so much, Dr. Mehta, for your time today. Thank you so much, Udit. Thanks for inviting us. Pleasure. With that, we conclude an exciting episode here on the AABIP podcast. I hope you guys enjoyed listening to it as much as I enjoyed hosting it. Do also check out our website, theippodcast.com, and please do provide us with feedback and suggestions on what topic and which expert you want to hear next. Until next time, take care.